Hello. There's just a few of us and we're all tired. So I'm going to be brief. And I'm going to make a presentation of a campaign. A wonderful campaign that we have organized in Vivo Sano Foundation. In this scientific conference, it would be useful for healthcare professionals to become aware of the fact that all of this should be transmitted, should be conveyed to the general public. My presentation is conceived to be adapted to any type of uh, audience. Nowadays, we have the problem of environmental toxicity. There are new substances uh, that can damage our health and for which our body, and our body is not capable of managing them. Our bodies have never been in contact with these circumstances or these agents or these circumstances. Uh, so this initiative doesn't uh, focus so much on scientific reasons. It focuses on a need. The need is to disseminate the reality of environmental toxicity. I am going to be very brief, as I said. The campaign is called Schools Without Wi-Fi. And the website is uh, uh, www.schoolswithoutwifi.com. The problem of environmental toxicity could be considered to be relatively simple. So there's new technologies, and these technologies are introduced into the market and they have a series of noxious effects on, the, on health and on the environment. This approach looks simple, and if we think about it, we will realize that there's a skeleton in the cupboard. In the same way as people say that uh, birds are uh, wonderful, well, here we can realize that something is not uh, working properly. And the global view seems simple. Industry should have a series of controls to design these new products. Uh, politicians should uh, assess, should make appropriate risk assessment, and citizens should be responsible and should, and there should be environmental health uh, medicine professionals that may uh, be able to mitigate the noxious uh, effects of these technologies. But if we go deeper, you will realize that the details are very important. This morning, Dr. Romano made a summary of a scientific conference that took place a few weeks ago, and this conference said, uh, mentioned uh, the importance of the role of independent scientists. Independent scientists are facing a very significant challenge, namely lack of funding. But uh, this this is not the. Uh, this is a quite a widespread problem, and then national and international institutions should be independent. However, uh, conflicts of interest are very, very common. Today, somebody was mentioning some companies that defended public health, but at the same time, their managers were related with industries that have uh, interest in those sectors, and then there should be a legislation that protects uh, everybody, and this is not really very clear. I want to talk to you about the principle of precaution, which has been mentioned in the past. I don't know whether you're familiar with it. The principle of precaution says that when there is a risk and there's no certainty that a certain product is innocuous, then there are reasons for the authorities to act and to withdraw this um, product before it causes any harm. Uh, as you know, as you can see, some people have even said that it is possible to prevent the distribution of products that can uh, entail a certain danger for health and even withdraw them from the market. So they are withdrawn from the market once the catastrophe has already occurred, once people have died. But before invoking the principle of uh, precaution, well, people 
don't do not normally act. Now going back to this, this should have happened, the precaution principle should be used before these objects or these products come to the market. Once they have joined, once they have been introduced into the market, there should be enough information. And this doesn't just mean that information should be available. If there, even if there is wonderful information on a website and we're not capable of accessing it, then this information is not useful. It's important to identify the information, especially in terms of labels. And it is important to understand what labels say. And also, the people speak about the need to perform a dissemination and awareness raising campaigns by institutions that are capable for regulating these issues, ministries, or uh, educational authorities, etc. Now, if we focus on uh, the noxious if, uh, effects, on the one hand, on uh, human beings, well, we know that there can be an effect, and um, some tools need to be used once exposure has taken place and symptoms have appeared. I also want to mention uh, environmental uh, health. Um, nobody can have a good health status if the environment we live in is um, poisoned. Now, within environmental health, there are two phenomena. In the first place, there's local contamination at all levels. So water, land, flora, fauna. So we are at the top of the food chain. So anything that is below us ends up inside us. And then there's the global effects. For example, the ozone layer, the uh, greenhouse uh, effect. And then I want to draw your attention to a document published by the European Environmental Agency. And I would like for all the speakers to be here in case some of them are not aware of it. It speaks about uh, late lessons for early alert. And here this document speaks about different uh, instances or some instances when there was an early alert by scientists or physicians but it was for some reason uh, ignored and the consequences that this has had for public health. And when I speak about consequences I mean diseases and deaths. Simply, even if it uh, sounds terrible, we need to be aware of, of, of it. Some chapters in this document, by the way, you can access this document for free. Some chapters speak about benzene, they speak about uh, asbestos, uh, lung cancer, it speaks about antibiotic resistance, it speaks about hormones and the effect it has had, mad cow disease, etc. 15 examples in the last 100 years. Uh, so this is nothing new. You need, we need to learn from history, but so far we don't seem to have learned much. It seems that the regulation period from the first evidence to a uh, later period is quite long. In a recent conference, one of the speakers said that in the case of PCB, which is an endocrine disruptor, the, the evidence started appearing in the 30s and the 40s that it had a noxious effect. And only last year did uh, feeding bottles um, disappear. Now, if we now focus on our case, the new technologies we were talking about just now include Wi-Fi. And why did we decide to choose Wi-Fi? Well, we saw it was a technology on which th there was no certainty about its innocuousness. We thought that serious effects could happen in the medium and long term. We saw that in, in the case of Wi-Fi in schools, there was no alternative because if you take your daughter to a school and that school has Wi-Fi, then your daughter will be exposed to the, those effects. And then there was, there were some points that justified our campaign. As I was saying, this is the Wi-Fi technology, and very quickly, because you already heard uh, other uh, presentations about this, then different types of electromagnetic waves are, can be distinguished. 2.4 gigahertz, here we could classify the microwave oven, and the Wi-Fi is in the same category. Let me make a remark. After a certain frequency, 
radiation is called ionizing radiation, and ionizing radiation is carcinogenic. And within non-ionizing radiation, both low and medium frequency non-ionizing radiation are potential carcinogenic uh, radiations. Now, they are introduced into the market through the school, and the customers are our, our, our children. I wanted to show you a very short video. In Spain, there is a program called uh, School 2.0, and that's why we decided to embark on this project. In this program, we want we wanted to give a large number of students a laptop with internet connection. I'm going to show you this video where the former Spanish Prime Minister speaks about the School 2.0 program. El próximo curso escolar del gobierno va a poner en marcha el proyecto escolar 2.0 para la innovación y la modernización de los sistemas de enseñanza. Las aulas dispondrán de pizarras digitales, conexión inalámbrica a internet y cada alumno tendrá su propio ordenador personal portátil en el que podrá continuar trabajando haciendo sus deberes en casa. Lo más interesante es el The most interesting thing is the applause and how these initiatives are capitalized in a political sense. So an educational goal is uh, complied with because the internet is a wonderful tool, but nobody pays attention to health here. In terms of uh, this School 2.0 program, I want to show you some facts. The idea was to distribute 1.5 million laptops plus 80,000 for teachers. This was an idea, but uh, or the plan, but uh, unfortunately, the program was suspended because of the crisis. So, many people are very happy that this program has been eradicated because of the uh, negative health consequences it would have had. And this program obliged schools to have a Wi-Fi connection in their classrooms. So this was, um, 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 it was mandatory that the connection should be based on Wi-Fi. The noxious effects for health, well, are uh, well known. And I was telling you that there were a series of points that made us choose Wi-Fi of, uh, you know, out of the amount, uh, the enormous amount of risks that exist. But this is because there is literature that connects electromagnetic fields with long-term health problems. I'm just going to mention one of the of the studies. This is the Bioinitiative study. This is an analysis of 2,000 previous uh, studies, and the conclusions were that electromagnetic fields favored the formation of different pathologies such as uh, brain tumors. In different sections of this study of the bioinitiative, they speak about the effects at the health level, uh, effects on the expression of genes and proteins, immune, immunological problems, stress response, etc. All of this is documented in a study drawn up by experts on the basis of 2,000 previous studies. So we had a, a point uh, to start from. And national and international institutions, which are normally reluctant to say things that may make the population nervous, had classified, and this is the WHO, you know, the WHO is not really a radical or progressive organization, but they said that electromagnetic fields were potential human carcinogenic uh, elements, and this was in 2011, but it's not only that. Uh, on the 27th of May 2011, we have a resolution from the Parliamentary Assembly that speaks about potential dangers of electromagnetic fields and their effects upon the environment. In this resolution, many interesting things are said. But I just want to mention one. In general terms, it's, it's, they speak about adopting all reasonable measures to reduce exposure to electromagnetic fields, especially exposure of children and youths. So they were asking us, they were clamoring that we should start with this, and we did so. Now, if you remember, we were, I was speaking about the need of having some realistic legal limits. In the conference I mentioned for risks to 
public health, we had Yuri Gregoriev. Those of you who don't know him, I'll, let me tell you that he is very authoritative in terms of radiation. And he was telling us, after a long experience, that the limits, the existing limits in Europe were obsolete. They were absurd. They were based upon one-off exposures. They only focused on acute cases and they only contemplated um, delayed effects. Russia uh, um, has a different legislation, but this is a scientist that has no need to defend anything, was saying that the limits we have in Europe are completely absurd and ridiculous. And let me go back to the res uh, 1815 resolution I was showing you before. And why am I insisting upon these institutional issues? Because we are speaking about the WHO and the European Commission, and nobody knows this resolution. Not even healthcare professionals or educational professionals or parents. And this is something that should be disseminated. I don't know whether you heard of this document. I hadn't heard of it. In Resolution 1815, it says that campaigns, information campaigns, should be designed directed to teachers, parents, and children. And a cable internet connection should prevail. And these campaigns should be organized by ministries. But, but the ministry hasn't launched any of these uh, initiatives, so it has to be other entities that do this work. And this is what I wanted to tell all uh, professionals here. It is wonderful uh, to have knowledge, and knowledge should be conveyed to the public. The entities that should do this don't do it, and so others should take that role. Two more things about the noxious effects on health. On health. There is a manifesto called the Freiburg Manifesto, which says it is signed by doctors, German doctors, and they mention new symptoms that appear in their offices that they didn't know and that, that are resistant or uh, refractory to treatment. They say that it is important to act right now. It is important to conduct independent risk analysis, more strict and stringent limits should be introduced, educational campaigns uh, should be organized, etc. All of this comes from a group of doctors should have been disseminated to other doctors. This document was signed by over 3,000 doctors. And this was 10 years ago, in October 2002. I want to make a survey. How many of you uh, who are doctors know about this? None. Okay. And this is a series of conclusions of a Canadian epidemiologist called Martha Habers, who is somebody who speaks clearly, and this refers to Wi-Fi in schools. As, I, as you can see, she's clear that Wi-Fi can promote tumors. It affects mo the mobility of um, red blood cells. It produces arrhythmias, tachycardia, headache, behavioral problems, learning problems, etc. It's not a question of alarming people. It's a question of getting to know the facts. Well, and now I will speak to you about our project after having given you a certain background for the urgent uh, introduction of uh, this type of campaigns. I will briefly speak about our own uh, campaign. Because when we launched this uh, project, people told us, yes, but I do want to use the internet. But we told them, but of course you can access the internet, but you can y use a cable connection. Sometimes we're a little bit illiterate uh, technology-wise, and a rational use of uh, technology would be very handy. So children are particularly sensitive to this type of radiations, but professors who, are, who spend in, all day in schools also suffer the consequences. Our goal was very clear. To get schools to eliminate Wi-Fi and choose safer uh, connection modes. And we achieved this goal thanks to the crisis. I will show you a video of some doctors talking about this problem. This is Dr. Fernandez Salah. Could we uh, uh, turn the volume up, please? 
the statement that he makes uh, summarizes all that I've just said. Well, for schools, I would uh, ask them to rethink the whole uh, idea because an external agent that is biologically dangerous um, is not a good idea because there's no studies. No studies have been made uh, on the long term. Uh, consequences of Wi-Fi. And then children are very sensitive, and so we can have many problems with them, especially as a result of their sensitivity. Uh, the principle of precaution has been flouted, and so we need to implement clinical logic and prevention confronted with a biologically plausible risk. So it is a good summary of what has been said up to now. There is a possibility of long-term and medium-term and long-term effects, etc. So let's use common sense. As to what we have been doing, particularly if we want to stick to the most important aspect, we have had a press release in 2011, September uh, uh, 12th. And uh, this has been presented in different provinces, and we have quite an uh, important impact on the media. We organized a campaign and a press release of the uh, platform with other groups, such as the Ecologist in Action, as they are called. We send letters to Mariano Rajoy, Minister of Health and Education as well. And we had a meeting with the Director of Educational Technologies. We had quite a pleasant talk, but apparently nothing has been happening, I'm afraid. But anyway, we are really positive. There are a lot of parents are really concerned about their children and uh, when they have some time free, I mean, they will get mobilized. In Asturias, we have a person which is, who is very active. And send, I mean, uh, he he's really concerned about his own children and about their future. And that type of fear uh, allows him to act instead of just being afraid of it. And he has achieved to have cables in the educational center. He's in touch with political parties, union, etc. In a press release, that without being a professional, he could uh, have a quite an, an important impact on the media. What I mean, there is a, uh, an awareness right now. People can really do uh, uh, something. Now, of course, this would be impossible without uh, having the, the with us on board, I mean, the scientists, etc., and the politicians and the legal experts so all together. Let's try to do something. Now, um, short, we had a web page, etc. What has been uh, uh, um, best functioning has been our the campaign. As I said, we had a meeting with the government delegation. We had a summary of all the scientific studies which have been carried out on electromagnetic fields. And Professor Johansson, Johansson has participated as scientific experts of the campaign. He accepted it. And uh, by the way, in Sweden, where Professor Johansson works, Electrosensitivity is acknowledged as a disability. So, and there are uh, really uh, studies which have been uh, really convincing. And we are in touch with uh, legal advisors in case we don't know how to act, etc., and react. And what I would also like to mention, and coming back to that uh, risk which I, uh, about the Congress which I have described. As Dolores Romano said this morning, we would like to say if there is such an evidence as we have on uh, chemicals, etc., uh, a lot of scientific studies uh, on pathologies, there is a principle of precaution. Why don't government do anything? So the only way of achieving something would be through social pressure and lobbying. So here we are, the social action. Yes, and I will end up with it. I mean, the citizen being aware of the problem will face its responsibility. And we be cautious. It will eliminate all the toxic elements. It will look after his health, so public health. And at the political level, 
and the really in a four years period the politicians are only interested in that four year period really for them bring their mandate i mean a uh, person being just four years is not uh, uh, interested in doing something but at the industrial level too the industry uh, has got, uh, of course, its own interest, uh, defending its own interest, and of course, financial results, etc. But through the responsible consumption, we can have an, an impact on them. And I won't like to mention any brand, but anyway, not long ago, there was that uh, Sanex uh, brand name, said Zero Parabens, Zero uh, uh, Phenoxytalon, etc. Nobody knows these terms normally, quite frankly, but nevertheless, a brand is concerned about uh, launching a product, zero percent of all these substances. Mm -hmm. So we are starting to have a kind of conscious uh, in that the good products from my have, well, uh, are being now uh, defended that way and nothing else. Now, it is uh, quite a difficult way forward but I mean, we have to be constant, and this is what we are doing. We will go on working along these lines. Thank you very much indeed.